Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome once again to the Law of Self-Defense show. Thank you all for being willing to spend your time and attention here with me, attorney Andrew Branca at Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, a little bit late. Not very gay, but a little bit late. Sorry about that, folks. And a lot of uh, pieces to pull together for today. So what are we here to talk about today? It's the self-defense immunity hearing for Louis Casado down in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, Louis Casado, uh, we'll see a picture of him in a moment. Um, he looks, uh, well, you saw the featured picture, right? This picture, I'll pull it back up. This guy on the right, Louis Casado, a killer. Hard to believe. Uh, but he was outside a bar uh, in late or early in the morning, back in uh, the early months of uh, 2021, had been drinking a little bit, uh, was standing outside a bar talking to some other gentlemen who, for some reason, decided to start shoving him and slapping him, slapped his glasses right off his face, uh, Louis Casado was backing up with his hands in a defensive position. Uh, they continued to advance on him, continued to slap him, and he ultimately drew a pistol and shot one of the men, Adam Amayo, uh, shot at him seven times, uh, hit him, I believe it's five times, uh, with five rounds, uh, one of which uh, penetrated through uh, the victim's heart causing obviously a fatal injury. The other injuries pierced lungs and other important things that he, he might've been saved uh, from those others. But the, uh, the shot that went through the heart uh, was uh, untreatable. It was a uh, mortal wound instantly. And he claimed self-defense for this shooting. And as part of his self-defense argument under Florida law, it's possible for a defendant who's claiming self-defense to demand a self-defense immunity hearing. Um, what that self-defense immunity hearing is effectively is a, a mini trial before the trial. It's a pre-trial hearing. There is no jury. Uh, the judge acts as the finder of law, the normal role of a judge, and as the finder of fact, what would normally be the role of a jury in a uh, jury trial. And in this hearing, both sides get to argue the issue of self-defense. The state argues against self-defense. The defendant naturally argues in favor of self-defense. And under Florida law, uh, the burden is on the state to disprove self-defense by clear and convincing evidence. And, uh, oh, here it is, by clear and convincing evidence. Um, and if the state fails to do that, the hearing judge who would ultimately be the trial judge if the matter goes on the trial, is supposed to grant immunity from criminal prosecution to the defendant, meaning that's it. That's the end of the criminal process against that defendant in that self-defense case. Of course, it is entirely at the discretion of the judge. Again, there is no jury. So the judge is making uh, determinations of law and making determinations of fact, what facts he or she believes to have been proven. So this self-defense immunity hearing took place in uh, November of last year, uh, almost 18 months after the shooting occurred, um, and uh, lasted for four days. And we're in the process through a series of these shows of watching the live video um, or the video taken from those hearings. Obviously, the hearing we're watching is no longer live. That happened in uh, mid-November. Uh, but our, this analysis, of course, I'm here live, if you're watching the live version of the show. And um, Unfortunately, uh, I thought I had video of the first day. Whoops, I forgot to take down the little thing. Sorry about that, folks. Hey, I'm back. Uh, so unfortunately, I was not actually able to find the uh, video of the, uh, the first day of the hearing. I don't believe it's been distributed by the uh, various media agencies on uh, YouTube, unfortunately. Uh, so we started yesterday with the second day of the hearing. Uh, I don't believe the first day witnesses were all that important. They appear from uh, the court's orders to have been uh, mostly police investigators who don't have personal knowledge of the events, uh, probably establishing foundation for crime scene photos and things along those lines. So I don't think we missed much uh, by not having the first day. The second day, the coverage of which we began in yesterday's Law of Self-Defense live show, 
uh, began with the medical examiner. Um, the medical examiner, James Fulcher. Um, and he described the various gunshot injuries to the victim here. Uh, they were all from a couple of feet distance. He suspects uh, two of them were to the front of the body, uh, not immediately mortal. Uh, a third was to the side, the flank of the body, not immediately mortal, or, although all dangerous, of course. They pierce things like lungs. Uh, and those, uh, those bullets were recovered in the body. Uh, the fourth shot was to the back of the victim, as if the victim was turning away from this series of uh, shots. Uh, and that one was the absolutely killing shot. Um, the victim might have died from the earlier ones, but maybe not if he'd gotten medical treatment. But that fourth shot uh, came through the, uh, the back and uh, pierced the heart and lungs and aorta and lots of other stuff that you just don't live with uh, for more than a few seconds uh, with that kind of damage. Um, now, the, uh, the medical examiner also testified to the blows inflicted by the victim on the defendant here, on Louis Casado. Uh, these appear to be a series of open-handed blows, but very powerful, uh, enough to uh, uh, force Casado's head sharply back, enough the medical examiner conceded on cross-examination by the defense to potentially cause um, a concussion, uh, potentially cause death or serious bodily injury, cause loss of consciousness, so these were pretty vicious blows, and the medical examiner is the state's witness, but on cross-examination by the defense, the medical examiner's testimony was extremely favorable uh, to the defense. So that was the first witness yesterday. Then they had um, a couple of other witnesses that really weren't uh, very important. One of them was a friend of the victim uh, who was hanging out with him, who was an eyewitness to, the, uh, to really everything. And his testimony was not particularly harmful to the defense of anything. I, I thought it was favorable uh, to the defense. Um, he described the blows. He, he didn't appear to be too heavily shading things in favor of the state. He described how his buddy, the victim here, was repeatedly smacking uh, the defendant, smacked his glasses right off him, pursued him, smacked him more, got him backed up against the wall before the defendant here retrieved his pistol and fired a shot. So that was all consistent with self-defense in a hearing where the state has the burden of disproving self-defense by clear and convincing evidence. So that was, again, a state's witness, a friend of the victim, and I thought his testimony only helped the defense. And then the third witness we covered yesterday was one uh, Mary Catherine Jacobs. She was just a bystander witness. She was scoping out the bars where this happened for purposes of an upcoming wedding. Uh, and her testimony was really pointless. I mean, she didn't know anything substantive. It felt like filler testimony that the state likes to introduce when they don't have a lot to talk about. Uh, so just spending more time on, I don't know, making mouth noises. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing to do in a hearing like this where there's no jury. Uh, sometimes they do it when there's a jury because they're trying to create an impression in the minds of the jury that, look, we had all these witnesses. You heard all this testimony even though some of the testimony was pointless, some of the witnesses were pointless. And certainly this Mary Catherine Jacobs struck me as pointless. So I thought uh, yesterday's, our coverage of uh, the first half of yesterday's, um, the second day of the self-defense immunity hearing was, was quite favorable to the defense. Uh, today we have a bunch more witnesses. So this is the second half of the second half of um, the second half of day two of the self-defense immunity hearing for Louis Casado. And we have a bunch more witnesses uh, coming. Um, we have, let's see, I think I have them listed here. Uh, we have one Jenna Smith. She was like a bartender, I guess, in one of these establishments that was around. I mean, this happened in the street outside a bar, uh, but the people involved had been going from bar to bar. It looks like everybody was well, certainly the victim was extremely drunk, 0.266 uh, blood alcohol level, uh, had some oxy drugs in his system as well. Not a ton, uh, but the alcohol and the oxy tend to potentiate each other so they can have an uh, uh, exaggerated effect than you would expect from simply the dose alone. Uh, so there was that bartender to, uh, today we'll hear, from, uh, we'll hear from a general manager of a bar. Both of those are very quick witnesses very short. I, I don't expect they have anything much of value to add. Uh, the, the general manager is uh, Jamelin uh, Marsh, I think. Yep. 
Uh, and then we hear from uh, Corporal Wayne Farrell, a police officer. And these will be the last three witnesses for the state. So the bartender, the general manager of a bar, and uh, Corporal Wayne Far Farrell. And then the state will rest in this hearing. Um, so far, it doesn't look great for them. But after that, the uh, defense will begin presenting its witnesses. They'll do that today, too. We'll see how far we get into all of that. Um, I might pause today's show at that point. Uh, and then we can start fresh with the next show with the with the state's case in chief for this hearing. Uh, but in any case, day two of, uh, of the self-defense immunity hearing heard a lot of witnesses from the state, with some really important witnesses for sure. Uh, a couple of them are not really identified as to purpose here in the court's documents. Christopher Wingate, Ricardo Ruiz, Lindsay Degler, who knows who they are. We'll find out, I guess, when we hear the testimony. But we'll also hear in the second day of the self-defense immunity hearing from Dr. Charles Samuel Miles, he's an optometrist called by the defense. And of course, he'll testify to the, um, the defendant's vision, what was left after his glasses were knocked off, presumably with the glasses Let's presume he had 20-20 vision. Uh, but once they're knocked off, the defense has suggested his vision might have been as bad as 2200, which is legally blind. Uh, this, the, the court itself has noted that the uh, defendant's vision was at best, at best 2080. So I expect what's happening here is the glasses he was wearing might have been 2080, but the optometrist is prepared to testify it was his vision was actually 2200. But of course, this all goes to the defendant's ability to you know make decisions having been in effect partially blinded by the first blow uh of, by the victim when his glasses when the defendant's glasses were knocked off and then we'll also hear from uh charles brian moody is the last witness for the second day of the self-defense immunity hearing a defense witness he's an accident reconstructionist uh, so I expect he's going to present lots of photos of the scene, lots of measurements, um, extrapolate the distances that people were from each other. We do have video uh, of the shooting, of the slapping. Uh, I'll play that in just a moment. I guess I should uh, I should pull that up, I suppose. Um, but of course, a video is, uh, you know, one linear view of what's happening. So you, you it, it often cannot give you a good sense of uh, distance uh, when we're looking you know, uh, not uh, across the distance, but down the length of the, dis the distance. So I expect that's why they have this uh, reconstructionist here. Let's see. Yeah, so here is... that video of the actual confrontation. It doesn't show the gunshots. They kind of step off the back of the screen uh, for the gunshots, but it shows the sl initial slaps and it shows the victim uh, pursuing the uh, defendant down the sidewalk as the defendant has his hands up in a placating gesture, having had his no glasses knocked off with the first blow. So let me pull that up. There's no audio, unfortunately, so we're we're just stuck with the uh, the video. But the video is pretty compelling. Whoops. Okay, here we go. There's the victim with the with the baseball hat on. There's the defendant, the bald guy slapped. There goes his glasses. Somebody else slaps him too. He looks dazed. Uh, he is left-handed, so he's got his right hand in his pocket, but he fires the pistol left-handed. Ultimately, they continue beating him. And right there is about where he presents the pistol and uh, fires the seven shots, five of which would hit the victim with mortal effect. So um, I mentioned the, the self-defense immunity hearing is basically a trial, like a mini trial before the trial. Um, a lot of murder trials uh, are only a day or two, really. Uh, but this self-defense immunity trial is itself four days of video, uh, so, so four days of hearings. Um, and the reason that self-defense immunity hearings, having that option is a good thing, is because absent an immunity hearing, the only way to get a final adjudication, a final finding of self-defense is by going through a full-blown trial. And a trial is extremely time-consuming. Uh, it can take many, many months, sometimes years, to get from the event of the shooting, the Self-Defense Act, to uh, a jury verdict. Uh, they're extremely expensive. In a killing case like this, it's not unusual to expend a couple hundred thousand dollars pre-trial expense. And then it just goes up from there. So hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal expense. 
Um, and they're very risky, the trial, of course, because you're getting a verdict at the end. Um, and if you get convicted, that's pretty much it. I mean, the prospects for getting anything reversed on appeal are, are, are some fraction of 1% of appealed cases actually result in a new trial. And, and that's the best outcome. They don't result in a not guilty verdict. You just get to go through the whole time consuming, extremely costly process a second time in a new trial. And how many resources do you think you have for a second trial? I mean, if you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the first trial, you're probably broke. I see a lot of cases where a defendant in the first trial has very expensive private counsel uh, and then has a public defender at the second trial when they're lucky enough to actually get a second trial. So in the trial, you know, if you get a guilty verdict, that's pretty much it. Uh, in contrast, the self-defense immunity hearing uh, is much more time efficient. I mean, this is a few days instead of, you know, weeks or months. Um, it's much less costly. It's not free. It'll be thousands of dollars, maybe a few tens of thousands of dollars, but not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's, um, it's much less risky in the sense that in the worst case, if you don't win immunity at the pretrial hearing, you still have a trial to go to, uh, where the state then has to disprove self-defense beyond all reasonable doubt. Uh, so uh, losing at the hearing doesn't result in a conviction. You, you get another shot at presenting your defense in, in more favorable circumstances, because at the hearing, the state has to prove uh, disprove self-defense by clear and convincing evidence, which is about this much evidence. And a trial, the state has to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a heavier burden on the state at trial. Now, there is there can be a downside to a uh, pretrial self-defense immunity hearing, and that is the defense is essentially presenting their case to the state. Uh, revealing their trial strategy, as well as revealing any vulnerabilities in the state's prosecution case uh, that the state can then buttress in preparation for trial. Uh, so uh, I know a lot of criminal defense attorneys in Florida in particular are often hesitant to pursue self-defense immunity hearings because of those risks. Uh, nevertheless, we have the hearing ongoing here in the case of Louis Casado. And of course, that's what we're covering. Now, as we move forward through today's show, uh, as always, of course, we uh, do encourage people to ask questions if you like. Uh, the best way to do that is by being a Law of Self-Defense member. In fact, let me let me go through and make sure all, all of the streaming is working. So uh, yeah, YouTube's working. The Law of Self-Defense member dashboard is working. It looks like Rumble is working, and how about Twitter? And Twitter is working. Oh, I'm getting pretty good at this, folks, all this all this streaming stuff. So if you're a Law Self-Defense member, you're watching on the member dashboard, every question you pose there, I will answer. It doesn't cost you anything uh, because you are a Law of Self-Defense member. Just I do ask that you preface your question with the word question in all caps, so I can easily uh, distinguish it from the, the uh, other chatter that happens in the chat there. And folks, uh, if you're not a Law of Self-Defense member, I have to ask why. It, it's less than 10 bucks a month, 30 cents a day, and you get all your questions answered. The only other way to get a question answered is on YouTube with a super chat. That's at least $5. So it's five bucks a question, a question. Or it's less than 10 bucks a month for every question you pose no matter how many you pose. So I would encourage you to consider becoming a member. It's easy to do. You can do that at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. You can do that right now and get all your questions or, or they do need to be in a super chat form, a minimum of $5. And periodically through the show, I'll pause and, and look to see what kind of questions have come in. Um, I will notice one thing I noticed, uh, I saw observed in, uh, in the, um, audience. So there are friends and family of the victim here, Amayo, uh, in the courtroom, in the gallery. And uh, something I noticed that is not common, uh, let's see, here it is, is a lot of them are wearing these buttons, justice for Adam Amoya. You wouldn't see that in a jury trial, I expect. A trial judge would not allow this to be presented by members in the gallery. Um, in front of a jury, but because there is no jury here, it's a pretrial hearing, no jury. Uh, these people are allowed to wear these buttons. So justice for this guy, you know, I imagine there's some of you in the chat who would feel like, well, you know, F around, F out, find out, right? 
uh, the uh, the defendant here was doing nothing until this guy in particular, in concert with his friends, began really viciously slapping him around on the sidewalk. Uh, of course, whether or not the ultimate act qualifies as self-defense is going to be determined, perhaps, well, we know, in fact, that immunity was granted in this case. So, spoiler alert, uh, December 30th of last year, the court issued an order granting immunity. The court, the judge having been convinced that the state failed to disprove self-defense by clear and convincing evidence. But we're stepping through the hearing to illustrate for all of you how a self-defense Im immunity hearing operates in that manner of a mini trial. And then when we get to the end, I'll read through the uh, the judge's decision, judge's reasoning. One nice thing about these immunity hearings, I mean, there's, there's a lot nice about them. I'm a huge fan because they in effect provide a very time efficient, low cost way to get to a decision on self-defense that may allow you to avoid all the time, cost, and risk of a trial. Uh, but another nice thing is at a trial, when the jury returns, say they return an, a not guilty verdict in a self-defense trial, they don't explain their reasoning. They don't explain what facts they found compelling or what they didn't find compelling. Uh, they don't actually give any reason why they decided to give a not guilty verdict. It could have been jury nullification. It could have had nothing to do with the legal merits. But when a judge in a self-defense immunity hearing grants that immunity, decides to grant that immunity, uh, he generally writes it out in an order, his reasoning, his rationale, the evidence he found compelling. So it gives us uh, a lot of insight into the judge's thinking in the grant, or if it had been denied, in the, the denial of that immunity. Okay, so let's see if there's any quick, quick, quick questions that need to be addressed immediately before we dive into the video. <laughs> law of self-defense Miles Dog says, Andrew, it's 100% your fault that I understand the five elements of the law of self-defense. I just wanted to thank you from California. Yes, so good mention. So any claim of self-defense is based on five elements, up to five elements, sometimes not all of five. Uh, apply. But the most you have to worry about in any state or American jurisdiction is up to these five elements of self-defense, innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. And this cheat sheet, folks, we make this available for free. It's just a PDF download. We don't charge a penny for it. It lists the five elements and provides a brief description of each. If you don't understand these five elements, you can't understand anything about self-defense law. So I would urge you to download this for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. Uh, and the five elements, uh, up to five, apply always in any defensive person's case. Now, not all five may apply. The majority of states, for example, are stand your ground states, including this state of Florida. Uh, and uh, stand your ground affects the element of avoidance. You see right there. Avoidance has to do with whether or not there is a legal duty to retreat, if safely possible, before you can use deadly force in self-defense. In the duty to retreat states, and there's only 10 of, or so of those, uh, there, it's a minority position. In the duty to retreat states, if you had a safe avenue of retreat and you didn't take advantage of it, uh, you lose the required element of avoidance and you lose self-defense. If you're missing any of these elements, they're cumulative, folks. So whichever of the elements are required in a particular jurisdiction or in the particular facts of a case, if, if you're missing one of the required elements, you don't have self-defense. You're missing a required element to self-defense. Uh, so in the duty to retreat states, avoidance is a required element. And if you lose avoidance because you fail to take advantage of a safe avenue of retreat, you, whatever you did doesn't qualify as self-defense. Now, the majority of states, about 80% of states, uh, are stand your ground states of one flavor or another. The stand your ground states effectively remove that element of avoidance from otherwise lawful cases of self-defense. So you don't have that legal duty. That's true here in Florida. So in Florida... In otherwise lawful cases of self-defense, there's no legal duty to retreat. There's no element of avoidance. So instead of this defendant, Louis Casado, having to worry about five elements of self-defense, he's only got to worry about four. Innocence, imminence, proportionality, and reasonableness. Now, those four are still all required. And the state does not have to disprove his claim of self-defense in its entirety. Each of those four is a viable target for attack by the prosecutor. And if the prosecutor can disprove any one of those four elements by clear and convincing evidence, this defendant will be denied immunity in this hearing. Of course, we know that the state failed to do that because immunity was granted. 
had immunity been denied, the case would go to trial, and then the state would have the burden to disprove one of those four elements, innocence, imminence, proportionality, or reasonableness, beyond any reasonable doubt. If they fail to do that at trial, they lose the case. It's, it's an acquittal. It's not guilty. But if they can do that for any one, any one of those four required elements, innocence, imminence, proportionality, reasonableness, then there is no self-defense. The claim of self-defense collapses entirely. And one of the conundrums of a self-defense legal defense is you've already conceded to the underlying act that is the criminal conduct, the purported criminal conduct. So when you're claiming self-defense, you're not saying it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I was someplace else. I have an alibi. You're saying the opposite of that. You're saying it was me. I shot that guy, but I did it in lawful self-defense. Well, if your claim of self-defense collapses because the state was able to disprove one, one, anyone of the required elements of self-defense, then all that's left is essentially the confession. And the prosecution knows this, of course. They know what they need to do. They need to disprove one of those elements. And if they can do that, they know they have a walkaway conviction. And in this case, it's a murder case. Uh, under Florida's 1020 life statute, which is a sentencing enhancement statute for crimes of violence using a gun, uh, he's looking at 99 years in prison, life in prison. So the stakes are about as serious as they could possibly get here. Oh, yeah. Happy Friday the 13th, everybody. Ooh, scary, scary. I actually took a cruise one time on Friday the 13th, and there were three deaths on that ship while I was on it. Two crew members and a passenger. Crazy. All right. Uh, so I'm going to prepare, prepare to start the video. Before I do, a couple of uh, public service announcements. Really just, of course, um, uh, promotions for some stuff we have coming up. So first we have our American law courses. Let's see, where is the right thing for that? I can get rid of that button. Let's see. All right. So we're in the spring semester of the American law courses. It just started this week. Uh, we have two courses running. American law courses, of course, are our law school level courses for lay people interested in understanding the law at a lawyer-like level, but at a fraction of the time cost of law school and without any of the political toxicity of today's law school. Last fall, we had the fall semester with criminal law taught by our good friend, attorney Steve Gosney. Fantastic class. I know some of those uh, of you in the comments took it. Feel free to comment on that. Uh, this spring semester, we have two classes taking place. Uh, we have our uh, property course taking place on Mondays, Monday evenings, and our evidence course taking place on Wednesday evenings. Uh, the property course being taught by our friend Andrew Esquire. You may know him from his own YouTube channel. And the evidence course being taught by attorney Ryan Ballinger, who's got 200 trials under his belt, which is an unbelievable number. Uh, all these courses are taught on a semester basis. So it's 14 weeks of classes in each course taught on a weekly basis with an optional final exam at the end for certification. And we just had the first two, the first property and the first evidence course of the spring semester this week. And we're making those first two classes available to you for free to watch for free, just so you can see the quality of what's being taught there. And because this is the first time you, you're getting to see those courses for free, we, we've extended for one more day today, Friday the 13th, last day, folks, uh, the 50% off pre-registration for these courses. So if you'd like to watch those courses, uh, they're between an hour and two hours long each. Uh, you can do that absolutely no cost by pointing your browser to AmericanLawCourses.com. And, uh, and take advantage of the opportunity, the last few hours opportunity to save 50% on the registrations for these courses. Last day, next week, it's it's full price and the, the semester will be into the second week. And the other thing I wanna say is we've, uh, we've scheduled uh, the next Law of Self-Defense Advanced class. Uh, we only do one or two of these a year. Um, and I'm not sure we're going to do two these year, but uh, this year, but we scheduled the first of 2023. This is my full day self-defense law course taught live by me over Zoom. Um, I know a bunch of you in the comments have taken this course as well. Feel free to say nice things about it if you wish. Uh, this course will be Saturday, April 15th. 
and it's a full day course. So be prepared to spend the, the whole day with me. Uh, and there is a certification option at the end of this one as well. It teaches you really everything you know, need to know about self-defense law, both practically and on the legal merits. And it applies to all 50 states. If you sign up for this April 15th course this month, January, it's 50% off the normal registration. You save about a hundred bucks. Uh, if you sign up for this course next month, it's 25% off. If you sign up for this course in March, it's 10% off. And if you wait till April, it's full price. So if you're at all interested in this law of self-defense advanced course, I would encourage you to register sooner rather than later to get the most savings. And you can learn more about the course and register if you wish at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. All right. So one last look to see if there's questions before we dive in. Oh, there are from the Law of Self-Defense members who get to ask their questions for free, folks. Uh, I, I have to wonder why you're not a Law of Self-Defense member if you're not. Because you get all your questions answered for free by me. And you can become a member right now, less than $10 a month, folks, 30 cents a day covers you the entire month, all your questions at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. Plus you get access to, it has to be thousands at this point of uh, my videos, my podcasts, blog posts, sharing my expertise in self-defense law, all for less than 10 bucks a month at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. All right, so uh, let's see, a bunch of chatter by the members already. Uh, let's see. Question. Uh, Donnie asks, what was the prosecution's legal theory that the category of the homicide was felony and what evidence was he relying on to support that conclusion? So uh, Donnie likes to refer to the, the fundamental underpinnings of the uh, privilege of self-defense um, derived from for Americans, really from old English common law. Uh, and it's it's not that that's a bad thing to do, but that's not how modern day prosecutors approach these cases. They, they approach it in, you know, we can argue it's an illegitimate matter for, and there's a lot of modern criminal law that I think is, is not, not done correctly. For example, we don't have real probable cause standards in America. Um, if, if a prosecutor wants to drag you into a trial, there's really nothing that can stop him from doing that. Uh, we don't have judges holding prosecutors to a real probable cause standard, meaning it's literally, if you look at all the available evidence, it's more probable than not that you committed the crime. We don't do that. Uh, instead, our standard is if you ignore all the evidence in favor of the defense and, own, and pretend that everything the state is saying is true, is it possible that a crime was committed here? Well, that's a ridiculously low threshold to put someone, a citizen, to the cost and risk of a full-blown criminal trial, but that's that's effectively how we do it here. Uh, and that's the, that's what's being applied in this particular shooting. So Louis Casado concedes he shot the victim, killed the victim. Uh, the state says it wasn't self-defense. If you don't look at any of the evidence favorable to the defense and just pretend everything the state is saying is true, would that constitute a crime? Well, yeah, I guess so. Off the trial we go. Now, that's one of the nice things about these, uh, the states that have these self-defense immunity hearings is uh, instead of the prosecution being able to drag you into a full-blown trial at their whim, uh, you have the option of raising the barrier of the self-defense immunity hearing first and make your case of self-defense to the hearing judge, who, the same judge who would be the trial judge, but in the context of a much more time-efficient, less costly um, forum, less risky forum, that, that pre-trial self-defense immunity hearing uh, than the full-blown trial itself. Now, I, I, I should caution, uh, you'll hear most people calling these hearings stand your ground hearings. They're not stand your ground hearings. There's no such thing as a stand your ground hearing. States that are stand your ground, states that don't apply that element of avoidance in otherwise lawful cases of self-defense, you don't need a hearing for that. It just doesn't apply. It doesn't apply to anybody who is otherwise engaged in lawful self-defense. There is no element of avoidance. And all stand your ground does, the law, the legal doctrine of stand your ground, is take that element of avoidance off the table. 
automatically. You don't need a hearing for that. So there's no such thing as a stand your ground hearing. Unfortunately, Florida adopted stand your ground, taking avoidance off the table as one statute, and they adopted self-defense immunity, a completely different legal doctrine, that you have this option for this pretrial hearing to adjudicate self-defense. They adopted both those laws at the same time, and the media referred to both like collectively as stand your ground. Stand your ground and self-defense immunity are two completely different legal doctrines. They're not even the same statutes under Florida law. But you'll find even Florida judges and prosecutors and defense lawyers, even people who should know better, referring to a self-defense immunity hearing as a stand your ground hearing. It's just, it's just sloppy to do that. And it's wrong. Of course, you hear the media do it too, but you expect idiocy from the media. Uh, it's disappointing that legal professionals make the same mistake too. But um, if, if you, if, uh, if you refer to this as a uh, self, uh, a stand your ground hearing in, in my presence, you might get slapped on the fingers with a copy, a soft cover copy of the law of self-defense principles. Cause that's just wrong. Self-defense immunity hearing, not stand your ground hearing, no such thing as a stand your ground hearing. By the way, if you'd like to get a copy of this excellent book, you can go to Amazon, read the reviews, over 1,200 reviews on Amazon, five-star rated book, one of the best sellers in criminal law category on Amazon. Uh, but don't buy it on Amazon. Amazon will charge you 25 bucks plus shipping and handling. We only ask you that you cover the shipping and handling. We'll eat the cost of the book. And you can get this book from us just for the shipping and handling at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. All right. I guess it's time for, oh no, more, more member questions. Let's see. Uh, Law Self-Defense member Tax Pro Pam. Question, may I export the five element PDF to image file to share with friends and family, especially those who carry concealed? I'll be sure to drive them to your website and videos. I mean, uh, Pam, I can't stop you from doing that, but my preference would be that they come to our website to download this themselves. Lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. Uh, because that gives us an opportunity to expose them to more of our products and services. And that's how we keep the lights on here. So, you know, it's only, there's no, we don't lock the PDF you download. I guess you could put it anywhere you want and send it to anybody you want. Uh, but my preference would be that you send people to the URL, lawofselfdefense.com slash elements to download their own copy. Uh, let's see. Uh, Law Self-Defense member Konsaki says, do you think Self-defense immunity hearings should include criminal and civil immunity. So one of the interesting facets of these self-defense immunity laws is that the legislature passes the statute. And basically it says, do I still have it pulled up here? I don't have it readily available. Maybe I'll pull it up later. But basically the statute simply says, if your use of force was consistent with the legal requirements for self-defense, you have immunity from prosecution and from civil suit, period. But the statute doesn't set out any of the procedures, what any of the burdens should be, how high, you know, preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't even set out, Florida changed this recently, but originally it didn't even set out who had the burden. So does the state have to disprove self-defense in the hearing like they do a trial? Or does the defense have to prove self-defense in the hearing? None of this is specified in the statute. And frankly, it, I, I understand because it's not like the legislature is applying this, you know, statutes are not applied by the legislature. They're applied by the courts. So statutes have to be interpreted and applied by the courts. So the, the legislature kind of left it loosey goosey so that the courts themselves could define what has to be done. If you just look at the plain reading of the Florida statute, it looks like it's saying if your use of force was consistent with the legal requirements for self-defense, you get both criminal immunity and civil suit. And if you have a self-defense immunity hearing in a criminal context and the judge says, yeah, consistent with legal requirements for self-defense, should you get both? Should you only get the criminal immunity in a criminal self-defense immunity hearing, or should that also simultaneously bestow you with civil immunity, so nobody can sue you for that use of force. Well, the Florida courts have in recent years clarified this issue in you know, a way unfavorable to the defender, and that is that you need a separate hearing for each. You need one hearing for criminal immunity, and you need a completely separate hearing for civil immunity. 
And it kind of makes sense, right? Because in a criminal case, there's the defendant and the other party is the state, right? The prosecutor. In a civil case, there's two parties, the defendant, but the other party is not the state. The other party is the plaintiff. The other party is the person who's alleging wrongful harm was done to them. A tort, as we would call it in law school, was committed against them. Uh, typically wrongful death or whatever it might be. So the victim or the victim died, his family might be suing for wrongful death in civil court. It, it, it would seem improper to allow a criminal self-defense immunity where they're not represented, only the state is the other party, uh, to uh, have a loss in a criminal self-defense immunity hearing where, where they're not a party, strip them of their right to have their day in court. Right, and that's what the Florida courts have said. So in a criminal self-defense immunity, if immunity is granted, it strips the state of the authority to prosecute that defendant. But if you wanna strip the plaintiff of their day in court, you have to have a separate self-defense immunity hearing for civil purposes. And uh, so that's how that works. So uh, Casado here, as we know, spoiler, on December 30th, he was in fact granted immunity from prosecution. That does nothing for his civil suit, any, any risk of civil suit. Uh, let's see. All right, all right quick look for super chats remember super chats need to be five bucks folks if you want to make them and by the way i expect this video like all my videos to uh to be demonetized immediately uh it doesn't look like it's demonetized yet but usually they're demonetized pretty quick uh so there's no uh you know we don't get any advertising revenue from these videos because they get demonetized <laughs> i believe youtube still runs advertising on them if, if you don't have a premium youtube account you can tell me if, if you're watching my videos after the fact and you're seeing ads on them, but YouTube gets hundred percent of that ad revenue. They don't, and they don't share it with me because they demonetized my, my show. Nice of them. Nice of YouTube. All right. So let me pull up the, the video, the continuation of day two. The continuation of day two of the Louis Casado self-defense immunity hearing. And we'll see how long this takes us <clears throat> through. I'm inclined to only uh, finish out the state's witnesses here. So um, we have two shows that are state specific in terms of their, their case in chief in this hearing. And then uh, do a separate show where we start with the, the, the defense witnesses. I think that would make it more coherent, but we'll kind of play it by ear as we go along. All right, so uh, we had the last witness was Mary Catherine Jacobs, last state witness. She was a bystander witness. In my opinion, she had nothing useful to say. Uh, but then they took uh, like an hour and a quarter lunch break. So we're coming back from the lunch break now. And the next witness will be Jenna Smith, the next witness for the state. Jenna Smith, a, uh, a bartender. And here we go. All right, we're back on the record in case 21 CF1007. Look at all the buttons. Those are justice for the victim buttons. Oh, yeah, folks, I, I'm so bad at this uh, social media stuff. But if you could please, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the like button. Uh, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Of course, uh, what do we got so far? We got, uh, you know, we're not doing great on the like buttons, folks, with the number of people watching. Uh, and if you're not a subscriber, if you could subscribe, that would be great. We're, we're just over 46,000 subscribers. I don't really care about the number per se, except I know that the more subscribers you have, the more broadly uh, YouTube uh, shares out our content, uh, content suggests our content to, to new people. And of course, that's our mission here at Law of Self-Defense is to get the content, this uh, Law of Self-Defense insight and expertise out to as many people as possible. So if you could subscribe, and that's what you need to do to comment on YouTube anyway, uh, and hit the like button, that's greatly appreciated. 
J D N N A S M I T H. Um, where do you live? Saint Augustine, uh, Bible Twelve Village. And uh, what do you do for there? I bartend at Bog Brewing Company. Uh, how long do you uh, work there at Bog Brewing Company? Almost two years. Uh, so you worked there in May of last year. So the two bars you want to you want to listen for are uh, Dos Gatos, D O S G A T O S in the in the Spanish fashion. Uh, and right next door is the second bar called uh, Scarlet's. Maybe, yeah. Uh, they they generally refer to it as Scarlet's. Uh, and I believe there's witnesses from both. This is a bartender. She just referenced a, a, a bar I haven't heard. Uh, but, you know, this was almost uh, 18 months ago now. And you know how bartenders are. They, they often uh, <laughs> rotate uh, through a series of different bars. So, uh, but you want to hear, listen for Dos Gatos and Scarlet's. That's the, this fight happened, the, the killing happened immediately in front of those Gatos and Scarlet's was right next door. I did, yes. Uh, where is Bob Brewing Company located? Off of West King Street, next to this one. And so if you sort of like, US 1 is sort of a dividing line between downtown and the west side of that this would be on the west side? Yes, it is. Um, were you working specifically on the evening of May? And this is a, um, a state witness being questioned on direct here by a state prosecutor. Last year. I was. And were you working as a bartender that night? Yes, I was. Do you recall at all the hours that you worked that night? Um, I started work at five and I was finished. I probably clocked out about one o'clock in the morning. Um, do you recall that particular night, um, uh, a man wearing a black suit and a bald man wearing a black suit coming, coming into the Bob Green Company? Yes, I do. So that would be the uh, defendant, of course. Um, and just to refresh your recollection, folks, what we're what we're listening for here in her testimony, a, a state witness on direct examination by the state, is testimony that would effectively attack one of the four elements of self-defense that's relevant here: innocence, eminence, proportionality, or reasonableness. Does this witness or any of the state's witnesses have anything to say uh, that would suggest that the defendant here was the initial unlawful aggressor in this fight? that he was not facing an imminent attack, an attack either in progress or immediately about to occur, that he used disproportionate force in defending himself, or that he uh, he perceived the threat, he was making decisions in, a, in an unreasonable way. He was speculating threats, imagining threats, for example. Uh, that's what we're listening for here. Uh, the, the biggest, the two biggest factors I expect the state to lean on is that the absolute killing shot, the shot through the heart, actually entered the defendant through the back. Uh, so the defendant was had begun spinning away from the muzzle of uh, the victim, had begun spinning away from the uh, muzzle of the defendant's gun. So he got shot twice in the front, once in the side, and the, that last shot in the back. He also got shot. Uh, there's a fifth hit in the shoulder that appears to be inconsequential. Um, and uh, so a shot to the back would normally not look much like self-defense, right? Especially when the person you're shooting doesn't have a gun themselves, right? They don't have a projectile weapon. Uh, if, they're, if their back is to you, they're not striking you. So why would you still shoot them? Of course, the explanation of the defense would be, well, the shots were all fired very quickly. In fact, in the court's order granting immunity, the court steps through all the splits between the, the seven total shots that were fired. All seven shots were fired, I believe, in 1.6 seconds. So pretty darn quick, seven shots in 1.6 seconds, roughly an average of 0.2 splits. It's pretty darn, not super fast, but it's, it's pretty darn quick. There's no long pause where the uh, the victim, it's like the uh, like that execution shot in the Taqueria where there's a pause and then he fires a, an, you know, an anchor shot into, uh, into the victim. Um, the other issue here is that uh, the defendant went to the gun deadly for self-defense when he was facing only a barehanded attack. And I've said a thousand times, normally a barehanded attack is treated by default by the courts as a non-deadly force attack. Uh, and if you're only facing a non-deadly force attack, you're only allowed to use non-deadly force in self-defense. Uh, so the courts don't want to create a, a situation in which every common fist fight can lawfully be escalated into a gunfight. They don't want to do that. Now, there are aggravating factors that could escalate a barehanded attack from non-deadly to deadly. Um, if, the, um, if the person striking with their hand, for example, is much larger or stronger or has an exceptional fighting ability that their victim doesn't have, uh, th then their blows could qualify as blows readily capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. 
or if there's a disparity of numbers, or if the victim is exceptionally vulnerable to injury by a barehanded attack. For example, the victims on blood thinners. Well, a, a, a blow that might not injure a healthy person could kill someone on blood thinners. Uh, a disparity of numbers, there's more than one attacker. You can't really defend yourself against more than one attacker. I, I don't care who you are or what your fighting skills are. It's just the only way to effectively defend yourself then would, would be to go to a weapon. Uh, and here, of course, we have a lot of those factors, right? So we have a disparity in numbers. At least at some point, uh, the defendant here is being struck by two grown men. Uh, plus, he's made exceptionally vulnerable to attack because fights are dynamic, right? So you could fight, uh, start a fight healthy as a defender, uh, but if your arm gets broken in the course of the fight, well, you don't have the same ability to defend yourself anymore, right? Now you're exceptionally vulnerable, much as if you were on blood thinners. Uh, in this case, they knock this defendant's glasses off with the first blow. Well, if you can't see blows coming in at you because of your vision uncorrected, you've been made by your attacker exceptionally vulnerable to attack. Uh, so I think there are lots of factors here to contest the state's representation that this was a deadly force uh, defense against a non-deadly force attack. But th that's the argument I expect the state to make here. Um, do you recall approximately what time it was? Um, probably about eight or nine o'clock at night. Okay. And um, was, it, if, you know, was this an individual that um, cashed out at a certain point and gave him a receipt? Was that receipt sort of given, gave you kind of an idea of the time frame? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, so I guess this is evidence, testimony, that the defendant here was drinking at her bar uh, before he moved over to the bar where the fight ultimately happened. We don't have a blood alcohol level on the defendant. Uh, we do have a blood alcohol level on the victim, and it was, <laughs> I mean, it was 0.266, folks. That's over three times the legal limit for drunk driving. So he was pretty juiced, for sure. Uh, and he was on oxy, and oxy and alcohol potentiate each other. Uh, I would expect... It wouldn't surprise me to learn that the defendant here was also pretty juiced. Uh, but being drunk doesn't strip you of your privilege of self-defense. You have the same privilege of self-defense as, as you do if you're sober. Uh, being drunk only becomes relevant if your intoxication leads you into making unlawful decisions, you know, use of force decisions inconsistent with self-defense. If you defend yourself and you're your three sheets to the wind, but your your use of force is within the legal boundaries. You don't lose the privilege of self defense just because you're intoxicated. Um, did you uh, serve this gentleman? I did. Okay. Uh, but but having said that, <laughs> if you are lit when you defend yourself, don't be surprised when the prosecution tries to uh, suggest to a jury or here the finder of fact, of course, is the hearing judge that well, of course you made bad decisions. Look how drunk you were. Uh, they're allowed to make that argument. Yeah, the, the choker style sweater, someone's asking me, what, what does that mean? Uh, folks, uh, clothing like this and tattoos like this means that this one's for practice. I'll show you what's in mark for identification purposes of states exhibit H. Do you recognize that? Yes. And yes. what do you recognize that to be? Um, the man who was there that night. Okay. Is this a fair and accurate photograph of the man that you served that night? Uh, yes. All right. This time I'd offer states exhibit H into evidence. Any objection? No. That will be received into evidence as states exhibit six. Okay. I, I can't raise the volume much more, folks. Sorry. It's all the way up. The individual that was in that photograph, ma'am, um, what drinks did he order while you were there? Um, we primarily only serve beer, so um, it would just be the 16-ounce glass of beer. And um, um, as I indicated earlier, you checked him out at some point when you left? Yes. Yes, I did. Can I put you down? Okay. <laughs> Ma'am, do you have an independent recollection of the drinks that he ordered? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and from your recollection of what drinks did he order? It would have been two of our stouts and two of our IPAs. Okay. I want to show you what's been pre marked identification purpose. Does anybody believe she actually has an independent recollection of the specific four drinks this guy had 
a year and a half ago? I don't believe that. Think of she's a bartender. Think of how many thousands of people she served in the last 18 months. She remembers this guy that well. Don't buy it. Was it a state exhibit G? And do you recognize that? Absolutely. And yes. what is that? That's one of our receipts that we'll hand out or keep on file on the computer. Okay. Is this a receipt that was generated as a result of um, the, the gentleman's purchase? Yes. At this time, I'd offer state G into evidence. No objection. Are you receiving into evidence as number 12, state number six? You indicated you had four beer? Yes. And uh, two of those were uh, oatmeal, coffee, stout. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and what size were those? Uh, the stouts would have been served in a 60 ounce glass. And according to the receipt, there were two grapers? Is that right? Yes, yeah. Okay, and what size were, were those? Those would have been 30 ounce glass. The the uh, the um, the closed caption said sixty ounce glasses, folks. Six zero. Obviously, that's not correct. It's sixteen one six. So can you kind of describe <laughs> sixty sixty ounce glass of beer is pretty darn big. What the drinks are? Sure. Um, the breaker IPA is going to be a double IPA. It um, is going to be a little bit higher in alcohol, which is why we do serve it in a smaller glass. Um, and then the stout is just a darker, heavier beer. It's like not higher percentage, but the flavor is going to be more. Do you know what the alcohol? Yes, the breaker's going to be 8.5%, and um, the stout, I believe, was like 6%. Okay. Is that a higher alcohol content than, say, your average beer that you would buy at the store? Absolutely. Hey, I'll give her credit. If you're going to be a four working as a bartender at a beer joint, it's probably not a bad plan. How long man was at Bob Brewing Company? Um, yes, I believe he arrived about 8 or 9 o'clock at night, and then he was there up until closing. Oh, which would be about midnight. Okay. And the receipt indicates the time of 11.53 p.m. Does that sound correct to you? Yes, that would have been the time I swiped his card, but he definitely stayed a little bit afterwards. I have another question, John. Cross examination. That, that was it. <laughs> All right, so that was directed this witness. All, all the state really wanted to get to was that this guy, uh, the defendant had four beers, and they, uh, as you might expect, at, at a beer-specific brewery-type bar, the beers were uh, somewhat more alcohol, um, a couple percent more alcohol per glass than you would expect from a, I don't know, a Budweiser or something. Good afternoon, Ms. Smith. Is it true when he left the bar, he showed no signs of any care of alcohol? Not that I was aware of. That's all right. All right, ma'am. Thank you very much. You were free to go. Thank you. <laughs> that was it so jamelin marsh is uh a general manager of a bar she's a quick witness too I recently changed it. Monahan, I got married. So M O N A H A N. Thanks. Uh, how are you employed? Oh, I'm sorry. What? How are you employed? Um, I work full time at a restaurant. Okay. And what do you do? <clears throat> I'm the general manager. And what uh, restaurant is it? The Loop. And where is that located? In Jacksonville. Um, where did you work at before you went there? Um, I worked at a country club in Ponte Vedra. Before that, Scarlet's and Los Gatos downtown St. Augustine. And what was your role at Scarlet O'Hara? So as I mentioned earlier, Scarlett O'Hara's and Dos Gatos are the two bars in question here. The fight happens in front of Dos Gatos and Scarlett O'Hara's is right next door. I was a general manager of both. And how long did you work there? 
uh, almost two years. Oh. Yeah. Did, uh, were you working there um, on May the 28th and May the 29th of last year? Yes. Uh, and did, were you working in that capacity at the time? Yes. Uh, I want to take your attention specifically to May the 28th and then the evening and the early morning hours of May the 29th. Can you recall approximately how you got to work that day? Um, I was working double, so anywhere from 9 to 9 a.m. that morning till 11, I would have gotten there, 11 a.m. Okay. And then so through the way, night. You yeah. came away up to the closing time around 1.30? Yes. So you got a long day that day? Yes. Um, I want to talk about that day specifically, but first, let me ask you, did you know Adam Moya? Not personally, just I worked with some of his friends, so if he came in, I could, I knew his name, what he liked to drink, and but not personally, no. Okay. Um, was uh, he a regular customer there at Dos Gatos? Yes. Okay. And we say regular, uh, how regular are we talking about, like once a month? Between, um, just mainly when his buddies were bartending, he'd come in and see them on the weekends. Okay. So would it would it be every weekend or every other weekend? Do you, do you know? I would say maybe every other weekend. <clears throat> when you would when you saw him, was he usually by himself or with other people? Uh, with other people. Uh, do you know who Louis Casado is? Only because of that night. Now, that, um, that's the defendant, of course. May 28th into May the 29th. Um, I know you said your position was a general manager, but were you specifically working in a particular area at the bar? Yes, I had an assistant. So usually Fridays I'm at Dose, mainly Dose Gatos, mainly, and she's at Scarlett O'Hara. So I was helping bartend that night. Um, can you kind of give, um, or other, you probably have some information about it already, but just sort of a general layout. There's like a first floor and second floor of Dose Gatos, right? Yes. And what section of the bar were you? Uh, downstairs is third well, so all the way to the right by the bathrooms. Okay. So you said third well, um, but you said that's the part of the bar that's closest to the bathrooms. Yes. So if you were looking at the bar, facing the bar, it would be to the left-hand side? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you refer to it as the third well, so I'm assuming there's at least three wells. Can you kind of describe that? There's one, if you're looking from the doors, there's one right when you walk in. That's the first one. There's one in the middle, and then the third one by the bathrooms. And so the first well would be the end of the bar that's closest to the windows? Yes. And then you have obviously your second one should be your middle one, and then the third one would be where you're at. Yes. Um, did you ever see um, Did you ever see Mr. Moya and Dos Gatos that night? Um, yes, I noticed them down at the end of the bar, the first um, one. Down at the, near the windows. Yes. And did he, did he have other people that were with him? Yes. And what about Louis Posado? Uh, did you see him at the bar that night? Yes. Where was he at? Um, he was on my side, the third one. Did you have any interactions with Mr. Casado? Yes, I served him a drink. Um, did you um, did you serve him uh, more than one drink? Just one. Okay. Did any of the other bartenders serve him any other drinks? Uh, yes. And can you kind of explain that during the course of this night? Uh, what, um, how many drinks you ordered and, and what type? From the receipt, there's two drinks on it. Um, the first was a sidecar, and the second one was what I served him. Um, the other bartender had served him one previously, and then the interaction that we had was me, him ordering a drink from me, and then um, he had said that he had ordered another drink from the bartender, came back, or went to the bathroom, came back, <laughs> tried to order one from me, and said that he had, the other bartender had put it behind the bar for him, and just... It was like every work story you ever hear from a woman in your entire life. <laughs> I wanted to make sure he didn't get charged for it, so I remade it for him, and... The so, so there were, I guess, it, in the grand scheme of things, three drinks ordered, one of which he may not have drank because he had gone to the bathroom and it had been disposed of. But he was charged for two drinks that night, correct? Right? Yes. And what type of drinks were those? Uh, sidecar and then a, a well gin, I believe is on the ticket. And um, for those who may not know, what is a sidecar? Um, there's different recipes from everybody. Our recipe has two different liquors in it. Uh, it's about three ounces. The other drink is an ounce and a quarter of liquor. Um, would, would those have, what would the alcohol content of those be in comparison to say a, a beer that you would buy or a beer you would buy a store? Um, the first, or the first one is, uh, I would say about double. The second one would be one beer. And uh, I think I asked you about a sidecar. Um, what was the other drink again? The gin? The gin? Yeah. Can I approach you on it? You may. At the end of the evening, did you cash out, Mr. Casado? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to show you. I've got four exhibits here. I'm going to go through these one by one. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit J. Uh, so this is the prosecutor. I, I don't know anything about this person, uh, this prosecutor, personally. I can tell you I have heard from some defense lawyers in this jurisdiction uh, who have extremely unfavorable things to say about this guy from a professional perspective. Okay. And do you recognize that? Yes. Does that appear to be sort of a still photo from video from Dos Gatos? Yes. Okay. And is this a still photo? What part of the bar is a still photograph taken of? The first one. Okay. And this would be the end at Adam Amoya. You saw Adam Amoya? Yes. yes. And is this still photo a fair and accurate representation of kind of what you saw that particular night? Yes. Showing you State's Exhibit K for identification. And you recognize that? Yes. And you recognize that as a still photograph at the other end of the bar? Yes. Where Mr. Casado was? Yes. And is that a fair representation of what you <clears throat> Folks, they're, they're talking here about the defendant's drinks. Uh, it's not the defendant who had a blood alcohol level of 0.266. It's the victim who had a blood alcohol level of 0.266, the, the victim of the defendant's use of defensive force, Adam Amoya, the person killed here. He had the 0.266. We have no idea what the uh, defendant's blood alcohol was. There was no test done. You saw that night? Yes. Show you State's Exhibit L for identification. You recognize that? Yes. And what is that? Uh, the receipt from Mr. Casado that night. This is the receipt that you gave him when you checked him out? Yes. All right, is it a fair and accurate copy of that? Yes. And then State's Exhibit M, do you recognize that? Yes. And um, do you recognize that as also a still photo from that end of the bar that Mr. Casado was at? Yes. And does it accurately reflect what you saw that night? Yep. Your Honor, at this time, I'd offer states J, K, L, and M into evidence. Hey, yeah. I, again, all, all this, so they introduced into evidence photos of the bar. Uh, I don't know what that's supposed to show. The uh, They're not photos of the defendant drinking, for example, or video of him stumbling around or doing other obnoxious things. It feels like more uh, more filler evidence to me. First, I'm show you what is now marked with states at seven. This will probably be the video of the fight. More courtroom technology fun. Yeah, this, uh, so the video of the fight I shared with all of you is what was available from the media, and it doesn't show the actual shooting. Uh, now that we're in the hearing and the prosecution is presenting the video, it probably does not stop at the shooting. There, the, the version I showed doesn't have any gore or anything in it, uh, nor does it show the actual, you know, death event. Uh, but fair warning, when the prosecution shows the video here, it might well show stuff that would make some of you uncomfortable so and this is that state exhibit seven is this um the still photograph we were talking about yes there at the entrance of the, the first well near the windows yes and um and you can see mr Moy right here is that correct yes i'm going to show you now state exhibit eight This um, seal photograph we were talking about shows Mr. Casado at the other end of the bar. Yes. And does it appear that he's drinking a drink there? Yes. <clears throat> Showing you now State's Exhibit 9. Is this the receipt? Yes. You identify? And that receipt shows the sidecar and the end of the mirror. 
He's drinking gin. That should be guilty right there. Ugh. Right. Yeah, I'll show you six of this gin. Is that still photographed there? Is there a facade receiving that? Yes. All right, so cross examination by the defense now. I expect this will be quick. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. I have a few questions for you. I think you told us that you had been the manager at Joe Scott's and Scarlett's yes. for about two years. Mm -hmm. And over those two years period, you got to know of uh, Mr. Omoya? No, not necessarily. Well, I think you said you could recognize him when he came in with his friend. Yes. Okay. And do you know what his choice of beverage was? Yes. Objection. And what was that? Crown apple. Say it loud. Crown apple. Okay. And did you notice on this particular evening whether or not Mr. Omoya was at the first well drinking? No, I don't. I didn't. You didn't, you didn't serve him anything. But, but you had never seen Mr. Casado before. Correct. And there was a receipt you showed for two drinks, but apparently there was a mix-up with a third drink, correct? Yes. For one of his drinks, the first or second, he asked to be held while he went to the bathroom. Yes. And then somehow that got picked up and thrown away. Yes. So there's no dispute that he only got two drinks, correct? Correct. Right. And do you know if he finished the second drink? No. Now, when you were in the bar, um, and you, you actually served him, you told us. Did you notice him interacting with other people? Um, yes. Did you notice him interacting with the female? Yes. Having a conversation? Yes. Did you also notice him having a conversation with a gentleman? Yes. Was in, in his dealings with you, was he appropriate? Yes. Or was he gracious? I wouldn't Did say. Did you use please and thank yous? Yes. So, uh, presumably, this witness, because Florida has pretty generous rules about this, this witness has been deposed by the defense. So the defense knows all the answers to these questions already. They, they ask these same questions during the deposition. Uh, so when they, um, if, if they didn't know the answers they were going to get, these would be very dangerous questions to ask. But presumably, they, they already know the answers from an earlier deposition. Uh, was he pleasant? Yes. Was he at all appeared to be in a hostile mood? Did he appear to be impaired by alcohol in any way? No. If I show you some video of, of the bar that night, could you describe what you see? Yes. Okay, can we, Judge, I'd like to refer to Exhibit 2. By the way, folks, when I talk about how expensive these trials can get, hundreds of thousands of dollars, one of the things that contributes to that expense are depositions. Um, Florida generally allows the defense to depose uh, state witnesses before the trial, which is, I think, every every state should allow that. I think it's fantastic. I think uh, I think the the maximum amount of information jointly held by both parties going into the trial is what we want to have the best chance of getting to a fair verdict. Um, it lets the trial be much more efficient. There ought not really be surprises and testimony at the trial itself. Everybody should know what answers they're going to get to the questions they're going to ask. Uh, the, it, the trial should not be uh, the environment for surprise development of testimony no one ever heard before. It should be the forum for presenting known testimony to the jury that the jury can evaluate to arrive at a verdict. Uh, but uh, if there's a bunch of witnesses, like there are here, uh, and you're going to depose each one of them, depositions are expensive, folks. Depositions can cost thousands of dollars each. Uh, so you can see how the, and you might depose people more than once, Theoretically, so you can see how just the deposition cost alone can become very, very substantial. And we're going to look at the back bar, which is channel 11. Right. First, before we start this, what do you see here? Do you see here? In the circle? Yes. Ask her a question. Is this something related to what she's already testified to? Is this something related to what you testified to? Yes. What you see here. And are you in this picture? Um, yes. Okay. Where are you? 
I'm at the first well. Okay. So let's watch the video. Do you recall that occurring? No. Would this, is there any reason why you dispute that happening in the bar that evening? Uh, no. Was there any complaints that Mr. Casado was inappropriate to any, any patron of the bar? No. Okay, let's go to the next one, channel 11. And is this something that is related to what you previously testified to? Yes. And what is that? He's talking to someone. Yeah. Want to play the video? So all these formalistic questions you're hearing from this attorney, is this something related to what you formally testified to? To introduce any evidence in court, there needs to be a certain foundation in terms of the relevance or authenticity uh, of the evidence you're producing. The evidence has to be of a certain quality. If you took our American law courses in evidence law being taught by, uh, by Ryan Ballinger, started this week, the spring semester, you, you'd be learning all this. Uh, you can't just introduce a video randomly. There, there has to be some foundation for it. And the foundation here, or, or the state would object and it wouldn't be admissible evidence. The foundation here is that it's related to stuff she was already allowed to testify to. That's why the, the defense attorney is asking that formalistic question at the beginning. And of course, the, state, the defense is showing these videos because you can. it, it appears that the defendant here was acting normally, not excessively intoxicated, not being rude, obnoxious, confrontational. That guy looks pretty drunk. <laughs> Do you recall that occurring, what you just seen on this one? Yes. This video, which is at 23, ended at 2350. Yes. Okay. Is there any complaints from anybody, including this gentleman here in the white hat, that there was some inappropriate conversation? No. Let's play the next video. What, what is this to pick? What, it's so bright. What is it, why is it so bright? Because we do last call at 1.30, so we turn the lights on and ask everyone to finish their drinks and leave. And can you tell from the screen what time this is? Um, I can't see. One, What's the number? 41. Yeah, 141. 1241. And is this what you were talking about earlier when Mr. Casado was talking to somebody? No. Okay. Is this, are you in this picture? Yes. All right. And do you, is that the same person that he's, does it appear he's talking to somebody with a hat on? Yes. And I'm just wondering, can you tell the judge whether or not that's the same person he was talking to at the end of the bar? I don't know. No. All right, let's watch and see if you can recall this. <laughs> it looks like a vicious monster there. Do you recall that occurring? No. I don't have any other questions. Can you hear Derek? No. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. They call it Detective Wayne Carroll. Okay, so both these witnesses, the bartender and the general manager, how does their testimony help the state disprove one of the relevant four elements here, innocence, imminence, proportionality, or, or reasonableness? This defendant looks perfectly normal here. He's not confrontational. He's not angry. He's not disruptive. Um, and I think all this testimony is favorable to the defense, and these are both state witnesses. Uh, all the defense got in was that the guy had a couple drinks, but of course, the person that the defendant shot had more than a couple drinks. He was 0.266 and Oxy on board when he started obviously, uh, you know, beating the defendant repeatedly. So this wasn't any of, uh, in my opinion, of any help to this uh, prosecution. So let's see, uh, let me catch up on questions before we get to the next witness. Folks, the, on, on my end, the volume of the courtroom video is blasting. I've got it cranked up all the way. There, there's nothing I can do about it. Sorry. 
I, I wish there were better audio control systems for this stuff, but there just aren't. Or if they are, I, I, I'm not aware of them. Uh, that's why I have the closed captioning on. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bill, Law Self-Defense member Bill asks, can you recommend a reputable live fire or scenario training? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by live fire. I mean, most self-defense training with firearms, you'll you'll shoot the gun. That's live fire. You're not shooting it at anybody and no one's shooting at you. That would be insane. Um, there are places that teach uh, simunitions type training where you use you know, guns that shoot little paintball pellets. Um, I know where, where I was an adjunct instructor, the, uh, the SIG Sauer uh, Academy up in New Hampshire, they do that. I, I've participated in many of their uh, simunitions uh, scenarios. They like to bring me in because I'm just a small town lawyer, uh, but I can run a gun fairly well. So uh, it was a good juxtaposition for, frankly, you know, a lot of people in those courses were police and such, and often they're not very good with a gun. Uh, but simunitions where you can find it. And uh, in terms of force on force training, if that's what you're asking about, there's people who do that too. Uh, again, I would, I would, you have to be very careful about the quality of the instruction. Bad force on force training can get you really hurt or killed and may not teach you very much useful. Uh, top quality force on force training is incredibly valuable, but it can be hard to find. Uh, for good force on force stuff, I would recommend uh, Craig Douglas at shivworks.com. S H I V is in Victor, works.com. One word, of course. Craig does absolutely fantastic work on force on force. Uh, simunitions, my personal experience is at the Six Hour Academy. Uh, perhaps you can find other places as well. Just Google it, I guess. Uh, let's see. Uh, and Bill, as a second question, as of 2023, does Texas have a self-defense immunity like Florida? Uh, I have a standing page for a law of self-defense members. Um, they can pull up anytime they want, where I think I summarize the immunity laws for uh, all the states that have them. Let me pull it up here real quick. Yeah, I do. So, uh, because believe it or not, I don't actually memorize all the laws of every state, but it looks like Texas has a provision for civil self-defense immunity, but not for criminal self-defense immunity. So it doesn't have an immunity that can save you from prosecution if the state wants to drag you into court. And let's see. Uh, Steve B, law self-defense member Steve asks, instead of declaring a self-defense immune, could a state law declare that no tort liability arises against any person as a consequence of a self-defense action when self-defense has been determined in a criminal action? So it, I'll have to interpret here because it's a little ambiguous, but it sounds like Steve is saying, if you're brought to trial on a use of force charge, manslaughter, murder, aggravated battery, whatever, and you raise the legal defense of self-defense in the course of the trial, and you end up being acquitted, the verdict is not guilty, should that automatically grant you immunity from civil suit? The problem is we, we don't actually know why the jury acquitted you. I mean, it would be reasonable to infer that they acquitted you based on self-defense, but we don't actually know. They don't say that on the verdict form. They just say not guilty. So they're not specifically asked if it's not guilty because of self-defense. Th they might believe, for example, that it's not guilty because they just don't believe you shot the person, even though you're saying that you did. Or it may be not guilty because they're they're doing uh, jury nullification. So they, they don't think it was lawful self-defense. They, they just don't want to convict you because they don't. that's how they feel about it. Uh, so unless the jury specifically asked why they acquitted, uh, we don't know for a fact that it was on the grounds of self-defense. So... Uh, there, there's no state that does that. Uh, just because you're acquitted in criminal court doesn't mean anything for civil court. Also, keep in mind, the burdens are very different. So in a criminal prosecution, the state has to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's pretend that's disprove self-defense by 95% of the evidence. But in a civil case, the plaintiff only has to disprove self-defense by 51% of the evidence. So it's very, very different. So it would not be surprising that someone could be acquitted on the grounds of self-defense in a criminal trial, but but not meet the threshold to be a not guilty, a not guilty, not liable in a civil suit. I mean, just look at the OJ trial, right? Acquitted in criminal court, found liable in civil court. Two different legal standards. 
Uh, let's see. Scrolling through the members. Members, if you pose a question, please put question in capital letters at the beginning so I can pick it out of the chatter. Uh, Law self-defense member Bill. Uh, what I mean about live fire is where it's drawing from holsters in compromised positions, obviously not shooting at people. And you are correct. I would love to take the second time of training, force on force. I'm a new member. Uh, yeah, there's lots of good training that has you shoot from compromised positions, from on the ground, from around barriers, under under cars. Uh, you, ju you just need to shop around. I mean, if I were going to recommend training, uh, folks I know who do a great job are uh, uh, Will Parker, uh, Freddie Merck here in the comments. He teaches up in uh, the Kalispell area of Montana. He does a fantastic job. Uh, Freddie Merck's M-E-R-C uh, Gunworks, I believe, or F M gw.com i believe um but I, I expect if you just google will parker you'll come up with it um uh will will does a fantastic job uh, mickey shooks up in the chicago area carry trainer.com carry c-a-r-r-y trainer.com mickey does a fantastic job i just taught at his uh, four-day tactical conference in october uh, he travels around the country teaching that 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 conference was in uh, the Nashville area. Um, he, he did a great job. Uh, lots of great training in, in shooting, uh, uh, trauma care, uh, medical care, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and not just shooting, but also uh, barehanded stuff, grappling stuff. It was, it was a great four days. I, I really enjoyed myself. Perhaps, and, and kind of the graduation exercise is perhaps the most dynamic self-defense exercise I've ever seen. So they're, they, they're using smoke grenades, uh, all kinds of stuff. It's really, really exciting stuff. Um, so carrytrainer.com. Um, uh, Mike Seeklander does great self-defense training. I, I, I have a sense he's doing mostly competitive shooting training these days, but uh, I took a self-defense course with him. I thought he did a great job. Um, the, uh, the Sig Sauer Academy, I always had great courses there, although it's been about eight years since I've been there. So I, I don't know if anything's changed, but when I was going there, they did a fantastic job. Uh, you know, you just have to kind of shop around, but lots of anything above a basic level, a safe gun handling course, like the NRA pistol course, once you get above that level, there, there should be some degree of shooting from compromised positions involved. Um, Okay, and let me check on Super Chats real quick before we get to the next witness, the last state witness. And it looks like uh, nothing yet on Super Chats. All right, so let's get to this last state witness. This is Corporal Wayne Farrell, so presumably a, a police officer uh, involved in the investigation. We'll, we'll see as this testimony develops. By the way, interestingly, this judge likes to swear in the witnesses himself personally. He doesn't have a court clerk do it, which is not unheard of, but a little bit unusual. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Would you please state your name for the record? Wayne Farrell. And can you spell your first and last name, sir? W A Y N E F E R R E L L. How are you employed, sir? I'm with the St. Augustine Police Department, a police officer. And how long have you worked for St. Augustine Police Department? Just over 10 years. Um, where are your current duties with um, SAPD? I'm a corporal in the patrol division. Uh, were you working for St. Augustine Police Department back in, um, specifically on May 28th, 29th of last year? Yes, I was. What were your duties at that time? I was a detective. Um, in the early morning hours of May the 29th of 2021, were you notified of a shooting that occurred at the Estado Bar on Apollo Street in downtown San Augustine? Yes, I was. And what time were you notified of the shooting? About two o'clock in the morning. Did you respond to the scene? I did. And was it secured when you arrived? Yes, it was. What did you see when you got there? Uh, when I got there, the scene had pretty much been taped off. I talked with a couple of patrol officers, and then I think the first person I spoke with, non police, was uh, Miss Marsh. Who just testified in front of the court, you said, right? Yes. 
Um, and what was the purpose of talking to her? She had, uh, she was the manager for Doscato. She had made some clips of the video on her phone and she showed them to me. And uh, obviously at that point you were aware that some of, uh, some of the, all of what happened had been reported on you and so was it important to you to obtain copies of the videos from Doscato? Yes, and did you do so? I did. Um, in your review of the video, um, you, you kind of advised sort of the different cameras um, that were located there on the premises and with, um, where they were located. All of them are just the ones that would have covered this incident. I guess primarily the ones that covered the incident. Yeah, there was, uh, I believe there were two angles that one of them covered pretty much the entire incident. The other one just covered kind of the end of it. And then um, as far as for Dos Gatos, that was it. There was also one across the street at Schnagel Bagels that covered it as well. Uh, were there also video cameras inside of Dos Gatos? Yes, there was. At least a couple that captured, you know, where the bar was located. Yes. Um, and you said there were two outside. Yes. And uh, then you um, referenced, and there was also one um, sort of in the, when you walk into the front gate, there's sort of kind of an entryway. Sort yeah, of the entryway way. that leads from um, High Pollock Street into the bar. Um, you, you would indicate also there was, you learned that there was video across the street of the establishment called Schnagel Vegas. Yes, sir. And did uh, someone with the St. Augustine Police Department contact that establishment and, and video? Yes, Detective Balloon did. Now, um, specifically in reference to the, the video from Dos Gatos, did you make any efforts back and ask you, were there, was there a date and time stamp on that video? There was. And did you make any efforts to determine whether the, the date and time stamp that was on it was accurate or not? I did. It was uh, 58 minutes slow. 58 minutes slow. So, for example, if the time says 12 o'clock midnight, the actual time was 12.58? Yes. Or 8 yes. I guess? Yep. Um, so how did you determine that? Uh, just by looking at the, the live feed for the video. Okay. And when you're looking at the live feed, what are you doing to, okay, this is how either it's correct or this is how it's wrong. Just, I used uh, my work cell phone at the time, hold it up next to it, took a photo to show the time difference in the live feed and what the actual time and date was. So to clarify, you're looking at the live feed, which gives you what time it's supposed to be. You look at your phone and know that there's a difference and you know the difference. Yes, sir. And then you do the math and that goes to your machine. And you determine it's 58 minutes late. Yes. Showing you what's been pre-marked for identification purposes is State Exhibit N. Do you recognize that? Yes. What do you recognize it to be? It was a, the compilation video of the uh, different clips of the incident. Okay. So just to kind of clarify, you had indicated there were several different camera angles, several different video cameras that captured different things at in different locations, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and you also, at this got us and then at Schmegel's Vegas, correct? Yes. Um, and you refer to this as a compilation video. So. Um, does this have all of those angles um, in one video to show and then sync together by time? Yes, sir. Have you had an opportunity to review that? I have. And is it a fair and accurate um, recording as you receive from those establishments of that particular day? Yes. You aren't this time I offer State Exhibit 10. Objection. Yes, sir. Have you received a State Exhibit 11? Now, on Detective um, Farrell, before we um, I offer to publish that, um, this, these videos capture um, outside of this auto's from the moment that Mr. Desado left until he was taken from the scene. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Your Honor, permission to publish State Exhibit 11? Mm -hmm. Mm Thank <laughs> you. 
You don't have to go home, but you can stay here. <laughs> A lot of love going on. <laughs> oh, my God. One thirty a.m., folks. The prudent person is home in bed. Laughing, having fun. Oh, she was cute. That car might be going the wrong way down a one-way street. Yeah. The guy in the black baseball hat on the right is the guy who gets shot.
<laughs> that was quick. It's a killer right there. Where's Binger when the state needs him, right? Or uh, Kraus? Where's Prosecutor Kraus? Just waiting for the cops to show up. Completely compliant with being cuffed. Right, so the 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 police here would would argue that they're not making an arrest here; they're just securing him, detaining him for for safety. He probably told them he just shot somebody. So there's a you know prima facie argument of dangerousness there. He's not under arrest on a particular charge at this point. Florida law does have as part of its self defense immunity statute uh, that if it appears to be self defense, the person's not even supposed to be arrested. Uh, but the police in the first few seconds here haven't made that determination. This is in St. Augustine. That's it. Cross examination. By the way, folks, uh, the defendant obviously stayed right there the whole time uh, waiting for the police to show up. Could he have left? Uh, yeah, he could have left uh, if he thought he was in danger. And he might well have had good reason to believe he was in danger. I mean, the person he shot had a lot of friends there with him. Uh, but if he had left, uh, he would have wanted to leave purely for the purpose of securing a position of safety and then contacted the police to turn himself in. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You had pulled, obviously, a number of videos from Dos Gatos and Schnagel's case, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, was there more video inside of Dos Gatos that you all didn't secure in this case? Uh, the inside of the bar? Correct. I don't believe so. I think we tried to make copies of everything we could. Was there anything upstairs? There might I, there might have been video upstairs. I don't think we got video from upstairs. Okay. And is that because Mr. Casado never went upstairs? Yes, sir. Was there made any effort to track where Mr. Amoya and his crew were going inside the bar? Inside the bar? No, throughout the night, just not the entire, uh, in, not their entirety in that bar, no. 
So there was video of them upstairs. <clears throat> you guys did not see her. We did. Uh, now, we saw the video, obviously. We watched the whole thing go down outside. The location where Mr. Casado was attacked by Mr. Amoya and Mr. Reynolds Santiago, that was High Polymer, correct? Yes, sir. And that street is a public street? It is. And that's not owned uh, in any form or format by the people that own the building that those guys are starting? No. And that is a location where a person is lawfully allowed to carry a concealed firearm so long as they have a permit, right? Yes. And in your investigation, did you confirm that Mr. Casado at the time of the shooting had a valid and uh, fully binding carry concealed firearm permit? Uh, I personally did not, but our department did, yes. And, and Judge, pursuant to stipulation, uh, we do have a copy of that. We move that into evidence in our next month's exhibit. We, we agreed to stipulate that you have a concealed carry permit for that gun. That's the actual location. So as long as that's, as the court recognizes that, that our client did have a concealed carry, carry permit at the time. Oh. Now, pursuant to your investigation, would you agree that Mr. Casado and Mr. Moy did not know each other prior to this incident? Correct. And Mr. Casado had no contact with Mr. Moy or any of his crew inside the bar, right? Right. And pursuant to your investigation, uh, did you find any evidence that Mr. Casado harassed anybody inside the bar? Uh, no, I believe uh, Ms. Marsh said something about that he was uh, kind of got a little bit of an attitude with a bouncer at the end of the night, but other than that, no. Okay. And he didn't harass any females inside the bar? No. Not and then he had contact with people outside the bar as well, right? Yes. And. Um, People that he had contact with outside the bar that were not involved in Mr. Amoy's crew, he didn't have any difficulties with any of them, right? Not that we know of, no. Now, as part of your investigation, don't you normally try to take uh, stock of uh, the height and weight of individuals that are suspects or witnesses? Typically. Okay. And did you do that in this case as it relates to Mr. Casado? To get his height and weight from him? Right. No, we did not. And did you uh, did you learn what his height and weight were as part of your investigation? Uh, not specifically that I know of. I don't, I don't know what his height and weight were, no. If I showed you a copy of the police report, would that refresh your memory? Sure. I mean, that was, if that was something that was linked in there from before, it might have been auto-populated in for his uh, weight and height. Well, let me ask you this. You had interactions with him? I did. Okay. And uh, did, would you have any reason to disagree that his height is listed at 5'9"? No. And would you have any reason to disagree that his weight was approximately 165 pounds? Uh, no, not necessarily. Now, pursuant to your investigation, did you try to learn about the intoxication levels of all the parties that were involved? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, now, law enforcement officers did have contact directly with Mr. Casado, is that true? They did. And toxicology was done on Mr. Amoy by the medical examiner's office? It was. And during your interaction with Mr. Casado, did you have any indication that he was impaired by alcohol? No, and I mean, I didn't actually see him directly until about 5.30 in the morning, okay. but he didn't see him at that time. Did anybody, you know, obviously you were the lead detective, correct? I was. Did anybody in your agency report to you that they believed that he was impaired by alcohol? No, they did not. Uh, have you had an opportunity to review the toxicology of Mr. Amoy? I have. And did it confirm that he was... So just to remind everybody, this is the state's witness. This is the state's final witness. And again, as we've seen repeatedly on the cross-examination of these state witnesses, their testimony is very favorable to the defense. In a hearing where the state's obliged has the burden to disprove self-defense by clear and convincing evidence, more than a preponderance of the evidence. Sorry, Madam Chair. Well, I'm trying to know what the toxic what is the I do. Uh, 0.266. And did he also have hydrocodone in his system? Yes. As part of your investigation, did you try to learn whether he had a valid prescription for that or not? No. Okay. You didn't try to learn or he did not have a valid prescription? No, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he did. Uh, did you ever come upon evidence that Mr. Casado's residence within, was within this uh, city of St. Augustine? Yes. A couple of blocks away from where the incident occurred? Yeah, I believe it was on Carrera Street. Uh, at any point in time, did you all look into the fact that Mr. Casado had you know, eyesight problems? Uh, I, well, I mean, we knew of it because he had glasses and just and what he said initially to the two detectives that tried to speak to him. But as far as actually speaking with the doctor, I did not. In pursuance of the investigation, did your office collect the eyeglasses that were on scene? We did. And were photographs taken of those eyeglasses? Yes, they were. May I approach? Okay. For the record, I'm approaching with Exhibit G, Composite 1, 2, and 3. And, Detective, do you recognize those as the eyeglasses that were placed in evidence? Yes. And those are, are those fair and accurate depictions of the eyeglasses at the time that you all had taken them into evidence? Uh, yes. Judge, I would move these in as our next mark. Yeah, Judge. Yeah. Copy received as the case. And, Judge, maybe it's positive. Four agents here for positive six. Detective, have you worked other shooting cases downtown or just anywhere in your career? Yes. Uh, would you agree that the timing of how these cases develop is important? Yes. Would you agree that the distance between the individuals that are involved is important? Yes, I would. 
Uh, did you yourself investigate the distance or timing of the shooting? I did not. Uh, did anybody in your office do that? Not our office, no. Okay. Would that have been your role? Uh, it could have been. I think I know it was done by the um, investigators for the state attorney's office. So. Okay. And then are there occasions where experts are brought in to really look at these videos and try to figure out timing and distance? Sure. And how long have you been with the city of St. Augustine Police Department? Just over 10 years. And throughout that time, has there been, has there been violent crime downtown? I'm going to check it. So. Stay. Okay. Oh. You know, obviously, we just watched the video, uh, and we saw how the fight started in terms of uh, Mr. Amoya and Mr. Felix Moreno Santiago striking Mr. Casada, correct? Yes. Was there any discussion internally about potentially charging Mr. Felix Moreno Santiago with battery for the strike on Mr. Casada with the rule? Uh, if we did discuss it, it wasn't anything further than just a mention of that it could have been just because it was, we don't, we didn't speak to the, uh, Mr. Casado, who would have been the victim of that slot. Do you think you could have charged him based upon the video that you have? Yes. And at this point in time, he has not been charged, he being Felix Reno Santiago has not been charged with any crime for his actions on that night. No. That's all I do. Thank you. You too. All right. All right, folks. So uh, the court's going to take a, a, a lengthy, a lengthy break now, and uh, uh, then they're going to start with the defense presenting its case in chief for purposes of this hearing. But I'm going to follow up on that on a on the next show, the next live show we do, maybe maybe tomorrow or over the weekend. If not, then certainly on Monday. Uh, <laughs> but frankly, having seen the state's witnesses so far uh, on cross examine, first of all, on direct, they they didn't have any. Um, uh, really incriminating evidence that would attack any of the required elements in this case, innocence, imminence, proportionality, reasonableness, certainly not to the degree of disproving them by clear and convincing evidence. <clears throat> it's not just a preponderance they have to disprove it by. So if you think it's kind of some of these elements that might be wishy-washy, it could go either way. Well, that's, that's a 50, 50. Uh, that's not, the let's say hypothetically 75% disproof that would be required for clear and convincing evidence against one of those elements of self-defense. And then on cross-examination, each of these witnesses provides testimony that's extremely helpful uh, to the defense that buttresses the defense narrative of lawful self-defense in this case. So uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the state's gonna be resting its case in chief right here. That was their last witness. I don't think they've come close to meeting their burden of disproving self-defense by clear and convincing evidence for purposes of this self-defense immunity trial. And I don't expect things to get any better for them now that the defense is having its opportunity to call witnesses. Um, I think the defense case in chief here in the hearing is still worth watching in particular because they have a number of expert witnesses they're bringing in uh, to uh, buttress their narrative of self-defense, including Roy Bedard, uh, a use of force expert we've seen, we've seen uh, in other trials that, uh, that I've covered in close detail. But also an optometrist expert, an accident reconstruction expert who presumably will be providing uh, dimensional distances between people and objects and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, Roy Bedard himself, the, the use of force expert who'll testify about things like barehanded blows getting stunned by a blow, all those things. So I think that'll be very interesting. Um, but we, uh, we'll go in, we're going to continue that, I think, in uh, the next show. Before we go, though, let me take a look and see if there's more questions. Uh, so uh, Law Self-Defense member Konsaki asks, no move for a directed verdict after prosecution case in chief. Uh, I have to be honest. I'm not sure how that works in a self-defense immunity hearing. In a trial, you would certainly do that here. I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, but in the hearing, um, I'm not sure that's an option because we're not really looking for a verdict. There, there's no verdict here. There's a grant of immunity or not a grant of immunity. Uh, but I'd want to talk to uh, Steve Gosney or another Florida practitioner for kind of the nuts and bolts details of how Florida handles that. Uh, Law self-defense member Moto Guy or Moto Gal says, question, Andrew, does the hanging around undermine avoidance since he didn't need to be here at all? Uh, so the the defendant here hanging around outside the bar, uh, does that impact avoidance? Well, first of all, avoidance doesn't apply. Florida is a stand your ground state, so you don't have a legal duty to retreat anyway. Uh, avoidance is not a an element in self defense in an otherwise lawful 
case of self-defense under Florida law. So uh, avoidance couldn't be impacted here. But even in a duty to retreat state, the issue of avoidance doesn't arise until you have reason to believe you're under attack. And then you have to withdraw from the attack if safely possible. You're allowed to stand on a public street. There, there's, no, there's no avoidance question until you know that you're in a fight or about to be in a fight. So no, a, avoidance, even in a duty to retreat state, if this had occurred there, like in Massachusetts, there, there wouldn't be an avoidance issue here um, on these facts. N not by him simply standing outside the bar, certainly. And I think we did have a super chat come in. Let me take a quick look. Yes, well, a couple. All right, so um, Thought Body Contest, $5 super chat, thank you very much, says, uh, what the hell did he say or do to provoke them to attack him? Looked like they were having fun and joking around, and then they start punching. There's no evidence he did anything to provoke him. It could have been the, the dude in the black hat just being in a bad mood. Maybe he thought he wasn't getting enough attention. Who, who knows? Uh, but certainly there's nothing objective that we perceive in this video that looks anything like a provocation by the defendant. Uh, Wildman76, uh, $10 super chat, thank you very much, says, why would the second guy in the red hat not be charged? Uh, probably because there's no complainant. Uh, because, uh, see, this this comes up, actually. It's an interesting question. Let me let me close down this uh, video so I'm, I'm bigger on the screen. Whoops. Why wasn't the guy in the red hat charged? The cop said they could have charged him with a battery, right, for striking um, Casado. There are some self-defense instructors out there who will tell you that if you're involved in an event like this, to tell the responding officers that you want to charge the person who attacked you, or in this case, someone who collaborated with the person who attacked you, the person that you shot. And I've always, I'm not a fan of that advice. And by the way, some of the instructors who advise this are people I respect tremendously, uh, generally speaking. But this particular piece of advice, I'm not a fan of um, for a couple of reasons. But the most relevant reason is if you, if Casado here would have told the responding officers, Hey, I want to charge. I want to file charges against Red Hat uh, Battery uh, for slapping me. Uh, the cops are going to say, "Well, tell us about it." You know, those cops haven't seen the video yet. They're going to say, "All right, tell us about it." What did he do? What happened? And then you're starting to talk to the police about the about the event generally at a level of detail. I do not want my clients talking to the police about. Um, I want my clients saying nothing or very limited information. We we. In our, in our Law of Self-Defense live advanced class, folks, which we, we scheduled maybe the only one uh, for 2023, uh, just went up. Here's that. Uh, this is our full day Law of Self-Defense advanced course. We teach it once, sometimes twice a year. So we scheduled one for April 15th. Uh, we spend an entire hour of this day-long class talking about interacting with the police in the aftermath of a use of force event. So we, we cover all this dynamic in tremendous detail there. I, obviously, here, I, I can't spend an hour talking about this right now. We're wrapping up the show. Uh, but if Casado had said, I want that guy charged with battery for striking me, the cops are going to start collecting evidence of battery. And the only person they can get that from is Casado. And now Casado's talking about what happened. He just shot somebody and killed somebody. Uh, he's going to be facing a murder or a manslaughter charge, or could be. I, I don't want him saying a damn thing to police on the scene, except perhaps things important to his defense for the shooting. I don't want him talking about bringing charges against some other person. Uh, it's that's that's not important rel relative to his not being sentenced to life in prison for for the shooting itself. Anything he says to try to get a battery charge brought against Red Hat will endanger his legal defense or is likely to endanger his legal defense against the life sentence. It's just it's just not the smart play. Uh, so that's why Red Hat wasn't wasn't charged because there was no complainant. The, the only complainant could have been Casado and Casado prudently uh, was not filing a complaint. Uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, so far, I have to say, I've been very impressed by defense counsel. I thought they've done a really good job. Very, very uh, snappy, clearly well-prepared, know the law, hitting what they need to hit, not wasting time, not meandering around. Uh, very, very impressive. And I, and uh, again, I've just like I've not worked with the prosecutor, I've, I've never worked with these defense attorneys, but I've heard from people who know them uh, professionally, and I hear nothing but stellar um, feedback on these defense attorneys. So that's 
good for Casado, obviously. By the way, folks, this uh, Saturday, April 15th, Law of Self-Defense Advanced Live Online Class, maybe the only one we do this year. Um, <clears throat> we might do another one in October. That's six months later. Can you afford to wait an extra six months before you know the law of self-defense? Are you, you sure you're not going to be attacked and have to defend yourself, your family in that six months? But in any case, if you sign up for the April course this month in January, it's half the normal price. So you save over a hundred bucks. If you wait until February to sign up, it's 25% off the regular price. If you wait till March to sign up, it's 10% off the regular price. So the price just keeps going up until April. It's a hundred percent of the normal price. Uh, so if you're at all interested in learning the law of self-defense to the degree you need to know it to make sure you're within the legal boundaries if you have to defend yourself or your family against criminal predation uh, and have the best prospects for being hard to convict, then I would urge you to take advantage of the registration in January so you, you save the maximum amount of money and you can learn more about the course and sign up at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. All right. Let's see. If there's any final questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like I'm missing a video from the Law of Self-Defense member page. I'll, I'll take a look at that, um, Steve. That might have been an oversight on our part or, or something didn't go live automatically as it should have. All right, folks, I think that is, I think that's everything. One last look for Super Chats. Remember, you can always get your copy, free copy of The Law of Self-Defense Principles, a real physical book, folks. Uh, we uh, On Amazon, it's 25 bucks plus shipping and handling. We'll eat the cost of the book. We just ask you to cover the cost of shipping and handling. Lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. Uh, and you might consider becoming a member of Law of Self-Defense. Ask as many questions of me as you want and get your answers. Uh, no additional cost. It's only 30 cents a day, 10, less than 10 bucks a month at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. And with that said, I will uh, wrap up today's show. Just remember, folks, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.